So um, welcome everybody to the MIT Media Lab and to the soft launch of the MIT Computational Law Report. It is now officially going to be public and you can come and check it out for yourself at law.mit.edu. And I'm joined by, uh, I am Daz Greenwood, the uh, producer of the, of the publication, the show. And um, uh, this is Brian Wilson, our editor-in-chief. Yes. And we're joined by our faculty sponsor, Professor Sandy, Sandy Pentland of the Media Lab. Um, and as part of this launch, we we're hoping that you could say a few words, Sandy, about your article that, that we're publishing in release number one. No, yep, happy to. So um, it's a little weird for MIT to be hosting a law report and a program, particularly, I guess it makes sense. But the reason is, is that we see the convergence between all the digital tools. And, and the fundamental thing from my perspective is that <clears throat> laws by algorithms. This person does that, that happened, they determine this, they give it to that person, etc. And what's happening is, is the people in those algorithms are now becoming replaced by computers. And AI. So, for discovery, for uh, sort of default logics, everything from driving down the highway and having your account debited uh, to uh, uh, you know, being able to go to trial with various sorts of uh, evidence has been discovered by some sort of AI type of research. And so, um, as this begins to continue, uh, it's really worthwhile thinking about where is it all going to go and how are we going to do it. Because um, this isn't just about uh, cost. It's, it's also about uh, access to justice. Justice today is extremely expensive. And, and uh, you, know, you can make a reasonable argument that says that only if you're rich or you get pro bono services do you have access to justice. So that seems completely wrong. Um, and of course, it's particularly inequitable. And so, so we'd like to actually see is this an opportunity to bring much greater access, much greater equity uh, to the legal system. And the primary things um, from uh, that's a sort of like execution of law. From creation of law, we have a similar sort of problem. So anybody who's thought about reforming the tax code in the US or the medical system realizes that it is this tangled hairball where you can't move anything without having all these unexpected ramifications. And, and that's a major problem. Um, the idea I have for this is that we have, as uh, the human race, learned to build big, complicated things in the last 50 years. Uh, you can look at some of the big logistics chains, some of the big transportation systems, things like that, as situations that are probably just as complicated as the legal system in many ways. They deal with the complexities of the world, uh, but they work really well. They're modular, so you can update them. Um, they can be quantified as to how well they're working. And it seems to me the law needs to move in that direction. And, and the principles of that sort of design of complex systems are experimentation. You never assume that you can build things that are just going to work. You try it in the small and evaluate it like an instrument. Um, it's also something where it's modular. You don't like make it one great big hairball. You make it in pieces that can be taken out, put together. Each one of them has to be instrumented. And then the final thing, which you know people talk about but we never really do in law, is what is it we're trying to achieve? What are the values? What would we consider a good metric or a bad metric? Is it working? Should we replace this module or those modules? Those should be things, in my view, that get specified at the beginning as part of the creation of the system. Um, and they're typically not today. Um, and that's where we're going. So we could have something that's much more inclusive. However, we can't have something that's fully automatic because, as we all know, these systems go wrong and sometimes in really terrible ways. 
So it has to be something which extends the human capability, not replaces the human capability. Humans have to be in charge, able to look at it. Also, you have to have humans as sort of uh, human sensors, because the fact that you wrote down, oh, it's more efficient, doesn't mean it feels good, and it doesn't mean it's very human. So you have to be able to somehow feed back the human experience to cause the system to evolve and to judge it. And the process of doing that, of course, is uh, something that we have yet to explore. I think that's beyond the current conversation, but that's where we need to go. Um, some of the things that we do today out of my group uh, begin to work in that direction. For us, as uh, many years ago, we designed a, a large scale autonomous vehicle system for uh, Nissan that was based on some of these principles. And we limited it to level two, where there's always a human involved, because of the legal challenges of informed consent, of unexpected. Uh, results, and so forth, and thought that over time it would eventually evolve. Another thing that we do is build national data systems, so for instance, we're building systems in Senegal and Colombia uh, as part of our, uh, one of our not-for-profit spinoffs, uh, and we use the phrase open algorithms or OPAL systems. An idea there is, is that the system should be transparent, uh, they should be something where there is governance by all the stakeholders in the society to be able to decide, is this actually doing what it's supposed to do? And where are the control knobs to make it better? And so hopefully those are examples that are just two that we'll begin doing from which we can learn how to, how to do this uh, rather scary but promising future much better than we do today. Here, here. Um, and I, I don't think we can thank you enough for um, kind of making room for this to, to emerge at, at MIT as a faculty sponsor, and especially for your article um, to lay out the vision of what computational law is and what it can be. So, Sandy, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for you know really making this happen because it certainly wouldn't be possible without you. Here, here. Okay, so um, now we're going to move on with the show. And okay, excuse, sir. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to break I get a good break. He often tells me I get a B minus. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go up to an A of some variety. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, good. Okay. <laughs> What's up, Peter? <laughs> but, um, and so let's take a quick look at the content and then. <clears throat> We're going to um, we're going to fill it out uh, with a practitioner in the field um, and you just, with you somebody. So I can put mine on share. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, and share it myself. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're talking about. We told you that there is a publication, and here it is. Um, let me just double check with um, our folks online. Um, Adriana or Catherine, can you um, Yes. Okay, um, so here we are. Um, so to talk through the written content, I want to ask um, the editor-in-chief who's really spent a long time with the authors and getting this um, content up to snuff, uh, Brian Wilson, if you could sort of talk us through the articles briefly, and then I'll we'll talk us through the rich media, the podcasts, and the, the the video, and then we'll get right into the presentations. That sounds great. Um, so as, as I mentioned, I'm Brian Wilson. I'm the editor in chief for this publication, and uh, you know I've had the the great experience of working with all these authors, Sandy included, um, to kind of like start seeding the field for what computational law might grow into. Um, and so uh, Sandy's article, as he as you touched on, kind of looks at the, the idea of law as an algorithm and humans as a piece of the logic in these algorithms. And so, uh, if, do you want to click into it? Okay. And so, so it, it does a great job at really framing, uh, you know, these things that Daz and I have been working on for a while, um, these, these kind of like basic concepts, and, and, and really gets into like, how would computational law look as uh, a design pattern? And so there are a few, uh, if you keep scrolling, there are a few uh, 
kind of like guideposts that you can look for. Um, so, you, you know, you specify the system performance goals, you measure and evaluate the criteria that you kind of set out, you engage in testing, you adapt the system design, you audit the system, and you kind of create this, what you, what you wind up doing is creating this feedback loop where laws can quantitatively be evaluated and improved based on the changes to, you know, whatever environment you're in. And so I think that's really exciting. Um, the next article that we have is one that has kind of, kind of come together pretty quickly as well um, from Kat Moon, um, where she's exploring the changing role of the lawyer in this kind of new computational paradigm. And uh, she, she's got a great set of graphics. She's working with uh, the Delta Model Lawyer Working Group, and they, they kind of uh, take the idea of the T-shaped lawyer where you're really deep in one field and you've kind of got a broad expertise in a bunch of fields and they look at it as more of a triangle where there are these different competencies that you can have based on these emerging roles in the in the legal ecosystem and so for example you might have uh you know some something that's really deep in the law like you do in the bottom left corner there um you, you might have something that's more uh that's more uh technical and uh you know on that operation side and that's more in the upper right um you might have something that's where it's really just a person who's in charge of leading. And so, you know, as you see in the bottom right, that, that has a lot more of those, those personal effectiveness qualities of relationship management, entrepreneurial kind of mindset and communication. And so, uh, you know, I, I think this does a good job at, at showing how kind of uh, adaptive uh, the lawyer needs to be in these, in these new paradigms. Um, and then we have uh, an article um, by Dan Linna, the future of law and computational technologies, where he 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 does something I, I think that's really interesting. He frames a lot of these challenges that are faced. Um, Sandy had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, not being able to access the legal system very well. So uh, Dan points out in his article that current estimates are that eighty percent of impoverished don't have access to legal services, and around fifty percent of the middle class don't have access to adequate legal services. And, and so it's looking at the, the idea that, you know, AI and computation can serve some role in accounting for some of these issues. Um, you know, you, you look at things like online dispute resolution that can be highly effective at getting kind of like the, the massive sort of uh, problems that are out there, the, the very common problems triaged into, you know, just those little packets that absolutely need a lawyer. You know, so the lawyers no longer do busy work, they're actually practicing at the top of their license. Um, and then next we've got an article by John Clippinger uh, that, that kind of, it, I, I love this article because it kind of starts from scratch. It's like, okay, what if we, you know, what if we were using all this great technology that we have and, and we redesigned uh, the legal structure, so like a, a C Corp or an LLC or something like that. And so what he's done is he's kind of taken these biologic and catalytic design principles and said, okay, what if we could use computational technologies to encode these, uh, the, these values that we need to start solving for? So resilience, sustainability, affordability. What if we could actually encode those into a legal structure that people could then be a part of? Um, and if you get down to the graphic at the bottom, he's got kind of like an interesting uh, way to model that as, uh, as a legal structure. And so you, you can kind of see here that, uh, you know, you can specify goals and you can start setting up things like smart contracts. You can start um, using the, the, these flows of uh, transactions in and out of this, uh, this kind of RMS LLC, he calls it. You can, you can do that in a way that actually empowers the, the, the community that it's, uh, it's working for. And so it's a, it's a tremendous article. It, it, it really goes deep into what all of these processes might look like. And, and so that's a lot of fun. And then finally, um, the last article that we have is the, the automated uh, formation of our entity. So uh, we uh, set up an LLC so that we would have a little bit of flexibility in regards to um, you know, taking in money from different groups and kind of handling things that way. Uh, and we worked with uh, the Brooklyn Law um, Incubation and Policy Clinic, I think, is what the BLIP stands for. But we worked with the BLIP Clinic and 
the Brooklyn Law Incubator and Policy Clinic. Uh, we worked with Jonathan Askin, who's uh, the founder of Legal Hackers, and uh, his team of students at the Brooklyn Law in the Incubator, Brooklyn Law Incubator and Policy Clinic, to, to actually get us set up with kind of like an automated formation of our entity. So it's kind of like a meta reflection on <laughs> the state of the art in law. Um, so uh, very much eating our own dog food there. Yeah. Um, and it was delicious. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. That's fine. And that gets, that gets right into uh, you know, the, the rich media. Indeed. Um, and uh, we should be capitalizing here. Um, and so the rich media, um, this is, so this is, these things are never finished. They're just done at a certain point with a deadline. So you may expect um, to see little tweaks and changes uh, to the site over the next few days. Um, and I should probably also mention that we have a, a kind of a rolling release approach. And so uh, rather than calling this um, issue one of a law review journal, um, we're calling it a release, more like software. And so this is release 1.0. And um, we had release 0.5 and 0.7, I think, at mm -hmm. the beta launch about a month ago. Uh, the next will be 1.1 when we add some things. And we have a, a little bit more content uh, in the pipeline. And as we add that, we'll up rev the, uh, or point, uh, the point release, so called. Um, so what, what are we opening with uh, in release 1.0 for Rich Media? Um, we have, um, I'd say, like the, the anchor is a uh, terrific set of podcasts that we did with um, Harvard Law School's Case Law Access Project, which you can find out more about at case.law, great domain, best domain. Um, so uh, the first podcast is uh, sort of an introduction to what they're, what they're doing, and uh, they, they've basically taken every case, every yeah. judicial decision, person from the start. 300 some, something years. Yeah like centuries of case law in the United States and um, scanned it, digitized it, put it in a standard format um, that's um, openly accessible. Um, and so we think that this is, uh, this is important. Um, you know, there's some services that, that you'll get from uh, uh, Westlaw and uh, you know, LexisNexis, which are very premium um, and, and, and really important for the practice of law and for some other things in there. But at the same time, um, law is, is uh, the essence of a public record. And so having a version of it, even a, a more stripped down version available, we, we think is important. Um, and we think actually, if anything, will increase the use cases and the, the marketplace for ever more premium services and ever better use cases. So we have a little introduction here. Uh, we, the second one goes into some interesting research that has happened on, on their data. And then the third one is creative hacks and projects. Um, so among other things, you can hear the law sing itself to you or on, on a synthesizer. <laughs> you, can hear, you can do a trend analysis. <laughs> you can pick a word and uh, look at how the incidence of that word is over time. Um, and then um, we, we, we want to challenge you. See, what can you do with this project, with this kind of law? Um, an MIT alum and a, uh, now a Harvard Law student and a member of our research uh, group at the Human Dynamics Lab, Robert, and a member of our editorial board, Robert Mahari, um, is actually uh, working with one of our researchers to um, explore this, um, this data set and to take a look at all of the class actions. So we'll be hearing more about um, that quickly in a few minutes from Robert, who's with us. But you actually can see his research report and discussion uh, with Sandy and our research team from just a few days ago uh, that we video here to get an idea of what you might be able to do with this case law. It has an API, it's bulk search, you can search, browse. Um, you can do some of the interesting hacks where you can do an automatic limerick uh, maker just to show what you can possibly do with it, a sentence from various cases. Uh, you, you can try to make a haiku maker. But more and more um, practically, there's um, uh, word clouds and, and other, other ways you can look at the data and find those neat patterns. Um, we also have um, a, let me find it, uh, here we go, um, a, a tutorial on one of our favorite open source computational law tools, which is called Doc Assembled. And do you want to say a few words? Yeah, about I can say a few words about Doc Assembled. So uh, over the summer, I was in Berlin and I saw this, uh, this great video pop up of something that I had been struggling with for a while, which is um, getting an environment for Doc Assembled set up um, using AWS. And 
I popped on Twitter and I saw Sam Harden had posted a video of how exactly to do this in kind of like this 20 minute, um, you know, little snapshot on YouTube. And so uh, I, I immediately reached out to Sam and was like, hey, how can we, you know, how can we collaborate so that this can be even more robust so that, you know, we can get the DACA symbol goodness to everybody who's out there. And for those who aren't familiar with DACA symbol, uh, it's it's probably my favorite uh, my favorite tool to use uh, in in trying to set up lightweight computational law systems um, because it's freely available to everybody. It's completely open source. It uh, it runs on um, YAML, which is a Markdown language, and Python, which is rel relatively straightforward to use as a programming language. But it has all these great features where you can you know automatically populate uh, Word documents, PDF documents. You can embed signatures. You can send text messages, you can send email, you can even do faxes. So, you know, uh, for, for a lot of these systems that haven't been, um, you know, adopted to you know, like using an API or something, this is kind of like the, uh, the gateway drug into uh, the computation, computational ecosystem. Um, and so I, I was really happy to work with Sam uh, to kind of uh, put, put out this list of instructions. Um, and you'll notice that there are links next to each step in the process that will take you to that exact point in the video. Um, and so, uh, if you ever get lost, or you know, you you want to start and stop, and you know, go cook some food while everything's running, yeah, and you forget to press pause, you can go right there, click on the button, and there you are. Yeah, just parachute right to the right point, and especially for those of you that maybe aren't, maybe aren't familiar with how to set up software. Well, then when I was learning, I would have to go back and do the same step again and again. So we think the link, the deep links into Sam's uh, video tutorial and the, the kind of the drill down step by step instructions we hope will be helpful. We want you to give us your feedback. Try to set up Doc Assemble yourself and see how it goes. Yeah. Um, we also, um, in, in line with part of what Sandy was talking about with the automation and even autonomous systems in the law, had a um, panel discussion, um, which was part of the Harvard, 20, Harvard Law School 2019 Legal Tech Symposium. And um, this particular panel was on tort liability um, for autonomous systems. Um, and um, I chaired that or moderated that panel. We had um, uh, some of uh, Primavera de Filippi from Harvard um, and Brian. Uh, Brian Casey from Stanford Law School uh, and Brian's um, ambit for research is autonomous vehicles at each level of autonomy. Um, and, uh, and Primavera is really into decentralized autonomous organizations. And we took, so from those two examples, and Lord knows there's a lot of other autonomous systems. There's an autonomous um, factory automation, there's autonomous weapon systems. There's a lot of different data points there. We took two that we thought were pretty easy to understand and just played through who would be responsible um, and how would you allocate responsibility for, um, for harm that they may cause? And that helped us to unveil um, some of the core legal design requirements, if you will, and then to make sure that they're engineered into the system. That's very much in tune with, with our approach here, engineering the law deliberately so that, so that it works by design. Um, exactly. So um, as a result of that, um, Steve Tendon, <laughs> who's done in our broader computational law community, made an interesting post to uh, LinkedIn where we, where we um, showed the video and he thought it was a uh, you know, great video, um, but um, it's sort of you know, missing a few things. Like what happens when, um, uh, here we go, here's his post, when AI and DAOs have babies? Uh, what are the elements of, of uh, self-sufficiency itself? Um, is it just an automated entity or does it need to make its own decisions or the role of the humans? And he asked five good questions. We thought they were so good, we did a podcast with them to basically have commentary on this panel and make it a little bit more accessible for people that are watching. So here's the podcast. So that's what's there. We're gonna keep adding the autonomous uh, legal entity and then, work. And then one thing that's uh, cool there, I think as well, is that um, with the automated legal entities uh, piece that Steve added, um, you know, I'm working with him and Max Ganado and a few other people who are based out of Malta to actually produce a written article that touches on a lot of the same issues that, that the podcast touches on. And that's um, hopefully going to be coming out here, um, if not in the next few weeks, at least in the next release, where it's uh, looking at you know what regulatory approaches you might take 
in order to start solving for some of these um, you know complex issues. And you can get a sneak peek of what's uh, emerging in Malta too uh, in that article. But um, the, the the next thing we have uh, of note is a nice interview with another MIT Connection Science fellow, um, Navru. Um, and she's very creative. She's an economist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're on this um, podcast, we took a deeper look at the connection between computational law and markets and firms, like even the theory of a firm, and it's adjacent opportunities and use cases. It's a very creative, interesting conversation, sort of almost a Davos approach to computational law. And this pairs really well with John Clifton we actually touched on it a little bit in the podcast, but uh, you know, there some of the ways that these different entities can interact within the concept within the broader market uh, environment um, start to get really interesting when when these entities are programmed. Um, Indeed. Um, and so, uh, last up, so there's actually several more podcasts in the hopper. Um, I won't tease you on those. Uh, we'll send an email out if you sign up on the site, so you can see them as they come out. But the next one that we're releasing today is uh, what we're calling legal primitives. Um, we are legal primitives in a sense. Um, but this is primitives actually in the cryptographic sense. So um, some of you may have heard of cryptographic primitives. There's some people in the room nodding their heads. Um, you know, they would be like examples of a cryptographic primitive. I think these are basically fundamental lowest level building blocks uh, of cryptography um, that you could, um, that are well understood um, and that have been well tested. They're very reliable, very reusable. Um, and so a, uh, a uh, digital signature is one of those. Um, the idea of public private key encryption is one. Um, uh, you know, there's a few others, basic functions. Um, and so it raised the question, um, what might in the field, the emerging field of computational law, what might the primitives of law be when it's computational? When we delve into that with Drew Hingis, one thing might be um, the idea of notice. I mean, this is something that comes up in many different legal instruments and processes. Is there a way to encapsulate that? Like what, what is valid legal notice on, on a network system? Um, the, of course, the, the concept of um, a legal entity came up and jurisdiction, um, jurisdiction came up. Uh, a, a number of interesting things came up. We threw a lot out there and we discussed it. And the part two of this will be coming up soon with our friend Christian Smith, who is uh, much more steeped in crypto systems. And he's got his own ideas about what should or shouldn't be, just from an engineering perspective, considered a primitive and where the tip could be for computational law. So that one's a little bit more um, speculative, I guess I'd say, but we think it's also terribly important. Um, so um, we have a place for reproducible software and data projects. And so this will be filled out more and more over the coming days and weeks and months, the years and decades. Um, and uh, right now we've got a challenge um, for um, this concept of an automated and autonomous legal entity. You know, there's a lot of groups around the world that are working on this now. Some blockchain groups like um, Open Law, uh, which is a consensus vote that has a, a, a allow, um, a, a, a kind of a, a DAO for LLCs and, it is, uh, and, and their use case is an investment vehicle. Uh, that Aragon is another interesting group and working with people there that are looking to create like a, an autonomous book publishing entity uh, where all the workflows and approval chains operate and it kind of pumps the book that's out on these open source espresso printers. Um, there's the DORG, um, people have collaborated with in Brooklyn um, and that's, a, that's an, another LLC form that's um, formed under the Vermont blockchain-based LLC law, BBLLC law, and it's trying to, so there's several others. Um, so, uh, so this challenge is to um, those communities and people that haven't yet created an automated or autonomous legal entity, to create some, we have some basic criteria to submit them, and then for the next release, we'll review them and um, maybe give a little prize to, to the one or the ones that, that really uh, we think make the most sense and that, that we can you know, help propagate for for others to use. Some of the other data sets that we're going to have are. Uh, I'd but, just like to add ahead. one bit to that. I, I think it would be really interesting to see if you know you could start combining some of these things internally, so that you might use the Doc Assemble tutorial videos as a way to start figuring out how to automate a legal entity. And that's something I've taken on a little bit as a side project of my own. But uh, um, 
Indeed. It would be it would be really cool to see, you know, the articles interact with one another. Um, we also have, uh, it looks like it's not linked at this moment, but we've got um, a concept of a finder, is what we're calling it right now. And it's basically, uh, you know, we've got hundreds of references to articles and book chapters and open source projects and technical specifications related to computational law. Um, and so we're putting those into a, a, a kind of a simple data um, base and making those available so you can, you can do some searches. Um, Show me all the ones related to contracts, and it will give a little bit of a filter. Um, uh, let's try it here. Um, contracts. Oh, here we go. Um, so we've got um, 36 related to contracts, and this, and this little link will bring you right to it. We'll be building this out um, over time. Um, uh, the the, uh, the categories right now um, are, are really. Well, all of the sub these are all subcategories of this emerging field of computational law, I'd say. So as people write more articles and contribute to the field, we're going to try to keep up and ask you to help us keep up by just submitting it through a simple web form so that we can have easier reference. One little sub part of this project, which I just want to touch on quickly before we move forward, is, um, it is the um, idea of tags. So um, we've got some collaborators at the, uh, the Stanford Blockchain Law Policy Journal, uh, the MIT Crypto Economic Systems Journal, um, uh, there's a Harvard blog, there's a UC Berkeley publication. There's a few newer um, publications that are in the area of one or another area of computational law. I've convened the, uh, the uh, managing editors or the editors in chief of all of those um, publications to ask the question, would you be up for using a tag set that is common among our publications? So that when you, so we basically will tag our podcasts and our articles and other resources, you know, as we see fit, it relates to computational contracts or legal entities or some legal process or technology or uh, maybe use case area. Uh, they'll use the same tags. They can add whatever tags they think are appropriate. Um, they'll have somewhat different, but interestingly, overlapping tags. And then when you click a tag that has some materials in any of our journals, it'll link you right to that. So we're calling that the tag alliance as a way to do um, field building and community formation in this area and to uh, catalyze idea flow. Um, that's what we think is most important about that. So you can expect to see that soon. Yeah, ta taxonomy was ruled out. <laughs> Um, yeah, but nothing's finally worked out. <laughs> so, all right. So let's let's move forward now. Um, and um, we have um, with us a person from Baker Hostetler. Um, and uh, I, I should add quickly that um, one of our advisory board members is Bob Craig, the CIO of Baker Hostetler. He's really been a thought leader in this area of computational law, transforming the law with technology, and um, and he's really. Um, kind of put his money where his mouth is with, uh, with creating some, helping create something called Incubator. Um, Incub and um, Catherine Lowry, um, who heads that up, is with us now to tell us a little bit about um, what Incubator is and how it represents um, you know, the application, in a sense, of computational law and where they can really transform the field from a, from a very sizable firm. Um, so, um, uh, Catherine, are, are, are you online? Can you hear us? I am. Thank you very much. I should first say congratulations to you, Daza, Brian, Sandy, and all the advisors for the launch of the MIT Computational Law Report. I think it's super exciting development, and we look forward to the collaboration and participating in it. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Inky Baker, and most importantly, I think the team that's dedicated uh, to uh, the service of providing a legal R&D in a major law firm. Uh, we originated Incubator back in 2015, but we formalized it and created a dedicated team in 2018. So we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, about that and our people coming up. Uh, but our focus really is across the team is, is to provide research and experimentation, uh, really looking at how we think we can change areas of the practice of law. 
Um, so we're looking at that from multiple different angles. Uh, we're working with clients, we're working internally to achieve that. But most important, I would say, is, is the team that's dedicated to it. Um, being able to construct a team along with Bob Craig uh, and create this uh, level of R&D where we're really out there creating some great stuff, uh, things that are successful, things that aren't, um, is really the name of the game here. The screen that I have up now gives you a highlight into the uh, people that represent Incubaker. Uh, we have a dedicated team of 10 right now. We're looking to grow that. Um, but I specifically segmented this slide so that I could share with you what we mean by legal engineer and then how closely that works with our technical team. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see a legal process engineer, you'll see a legal innovation designer. Those are offshoots of a legal engineer, which we think has and requires legal knowledge, subject matter, matter expertise, if you will, and combining that with kind of a technology and being able to translate from the business to our technical team, um, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we need this amount of time and dedication in order to solve some of these more complex problems. Uh, the legal process engineer and the reason there's different flavors is because there's different focus. Uh, the legal process engineer is to help examine process, technology, and the law. There is more of a focus in this role to focus on intelligent automation and AI. The legal innovation designer, another form of legal engineer, as I was saying, is more associated with transform transformational technology and identifying new lines of revenue or identifying how technology can change business models. Um, almost everyone on this list uh, are a KM analysts and a research anal analyst, which by the way is very critical for us to just do the heavy lifting of research and analysis and understanding the landscape of technology. Everyone on the left side has a JD. Some are barred, some are not, um, but they are steeped in uh, understanding the law and being able to work with the business, like I said, to work with everybody on the right, which are very, very focused on uh, technology from our senior manager of data science and digital innovation to a blockchain developer that helps us everywhere from uh, hosting nodes uh, as we're a steward of Sovereign um, and being able to help us with developments, uh, both on Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric, uh, all the way to helping us uh, with contract authoring. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the developments there in a minute. Um, but it really is important that uh, I think for us to share today, just kind of what kind of team it takes for us to be able to achieve some of these concerted efforts. And um, hopefully that's an enlightful or uh, enlightening to you um, I will tell you that some of the team's successes has come in the way in the form of computational contracts and uh, oftentimes we talk about smart contracts um, I usually try to insert here smart legal contracts um, because the smart contracts we know of uh, are, are more or less code if this than this uh, we really are focused on taking that a step further and making sure that these contracts are are legally binding uh, so just trying to emphasize that um, those are some of the nuances this team thinks about uh, we're working uh, taking those uh, legal engineers we're working with the business we're trying to teach them you know what is a smart legal contract it is the the combination of uh, the substantive work that we do in binding two parties together um, and traditionally seeing that in a word document as it gets digitized but then it's taking it again a step further and being able to uh, you use a programmable language to um, to code that contract and the combination of it is a natural language a contract combined uh, for human uh, humans being able to read that as well as machine readable um, so I know that's a lot about what you're trying to um, share in the computational law report this is really near and dear to us uh, we recently in August, I believe, or thereabouts in the late end of the summer, released our smart legal contract development for creating a functional smart contract prototype for the freight transportation industry. What this means is we are helping our clients identify um, issues that they were having reconciling the cost of fuel charges 
across two parties and over time having to reconcile those. Uh, the very nature of the contract that they signed had uh, calculations in it that allowed us to be able to help effectuate that uh, the post signature performance of those uh, reconciling uh, calculations of cost of fuel and by location um, and so on um, and, and over time that we think is going to allow us to really help our clients with things like increasing automation, improving trust and transparency between, um, between our clients and the parties that they are um, forming these contracts with and this overall just simplification of the process. Uh, so that operational um, understanding what's happening in the business. Our legal engineers are part of, our legal engineers are also equally a part of working with our attorneys on how we negotiate these contracts, what the contracts look like in form and function, and how can we take that a step further and apply that uh, more computationally. That's awesome. I I thought I would just, thank you, Brian. I thought I would just end by saying, you know, the legal engineers don't stop there. The part of the team and collective, both from the tech side and the engineer side, we're really looking at, you know, what's on the horizon and really trying to look out in front of us. Um, I put together a quick slide just to kind of emulate, here are the major topics that we're concerned with. Um, smart legal contracts we've already talked about. But I would tell you on the forefront of the horizon, what we see the most of and what we're analyzing are applications that are applying to legal that, uh, that apply machine learning. Uh, that's probably number one for us. We also are trying to uh, apply intelligent automation across the firm for process efficiency and working with our clients to do that. Uh, data analytics, natural language processing, equally as important there, um, starting to see applications that are now hitting legal that use a combination of, of many of these that we're looking at. Um, and I added a last one that's practical blockchain. Uh, I didn't come up with that, but Gartner is now starting to call practical blockchain as a means to focus on how blockchain can leverage, be leveraged in practical enterprise use cases, which is very important to us because that is uh, what's equally important to our clients is how to operationally optimize. Um, and so we think we can be a part of that. I will say that last but not least, um, this is just a little bit of a view into our classification and analysis of that landscape. The emerging tech dashboard uh, at Incubaker, we monitor over about 400 different applications on a daily basis. What's, what are they? What are the tools? What are the, how do we classify those? How does this fit into the legal environment? Um, and how can this help our attorneys practice? How can it help our law departments practice and create a closer relationship? Uh, the legal engineer's substantive expertise really is very, very important in making these distinctions and again, helping us with those R&D projects. So I hope that is helpful and kind of giving you insight into our world. Um, we look forward to collaborating with you in the future. Very helpful. Thanks so much, um, Catherine. And um, could, I, could I ask you to say just a couple more words on what, like, what exactly is a legal engineer? And like, how, how are you looking at that? You know, MIT is very much an engineering school um, and we, we hope to use engineering principles as part of the work uh, for, for computational law. Like, I know that you use this as a job designation or a job title. Um, what is it from a, from a Baker Hostetler perspective? Like, uh, how would you describe this, this idea of a legal engineer? It's so, it's so um, intoxicatingly interesting. Well, we'd like to think so as well. And, you know, I, I will be the first to say uh, there's so many different definitions of what a legal engineer is and, and how you can use them. To us, it's a dedicated role for a distinct purpose of working with our uh, legal services teams, our attorneys, and being able to absorb legal knowledge and combine it with the uh, technology advancements. Now with that, I'll give you a little deeper idea. A lot of this has to do with process optimization, uh, optimization, excuse me, and really trying to make sure that we understand and can almost deconstruct how an attorney operates today 
and then being able to identify where we have some opportunities to either apply computational law, for example, um, either apply automation for you know, process efficiency. Uh, but it is that deconstruction that I think is so important. Uh, not every attorney is built for this, but those that come to us that have this ability to understand not only what their attorneys are talking about, but deconstruct it in a way that gives us a vision into what the problem actually is, is what I kind of I constitute as a legal engineer. Um, so, you know, from multiple different angles, though, you know, I think there's different flavors, as I was saying before. Some engineers are going to be much more focused on process and, and, and mapping out um, discrete activities to really kind of deconstruct it. Others may be really focused on what's the business model. How will that help us drive revenue? How will it um, help our clients um, optimize that, uh, you know, process inside of their organization. So I think there's different lenses that you can look at, but I think it's really that combination of substantive expertise, um, being able to understand process, and then being able to translate that over to the other side. For us, that's the technical side. Um, if I asked one of our technical uh, team members to, you know, uh, go forward and creating uh, a contract and, um, you know, doing that, they're probably going to miss certain triggers or uh, areas that are particularly important for us uh, that may elevate risk. Um, so we need that level of subject matter expertise. And so to me, that's what it means. Yeah, and I think that I, I think that gets exactly into what one of the articles uh, kind of is trying to highlight um, the, the 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 Delta model lawyer kind of model where it's not just uh, you know now the the skill set that legal professionals can draw from it's expanding you know and these different roles these more nuanced roles will have a little bit of you know one flavor a little bit of another flavor and you can sign up kind of start to put together these recipes where you're getting a legal process engineer, you're getting a data science and blockchain developer, you know, you, you can start uh, kind of like understanding what these new competencies are to drive uh, new types of synergies. And I think that's, uh, that, that gets to some really exciting opportunities. Here. Well, I want to uh, thank you very much for sharing with us uh, a look from the frontier of uh, where, where computational law is being applied now in practice, Catherine. And uh, just as a little favor, could you just uh, pass back our uh, affectionate um, and grateful thanks to Bob Craig for uh, being on our board of advisors and helping to steer us. Absolutely, we'll do that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Okay, so next up, um, one more glimpse from the frontier, and then we're going to regroup and look at, um, at, our, at our key initiative for the year um, in terms of using data to combat modern slavery. But that's a little tease for the next segment. <laughs> um, but first up, um, uh, another member of our team, and a, where's that ring? And a double major from MIT, uh, who's now a Harvard Law student. Um, kind of living the dream of the uh, the philosopher king and the computational lawyer of tomorrow, um, Robert Mahari, um, who has got in the spirit of things and actually taken this CAF data, case law access project data, and tried to do something with it with one of the researchers in our human dynamics lab. Um, Robert, you introduce yourself and, and then tell us what, what have you done? Absolutely. So thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, I, I kind of launch into it with a little bit of a preamble, which is that as we try and reconceive of the law as an algorithm, it also forces us to reinvent and reconceive how we think about legal data. Um, and in many ways, access to data and access to law is a prerequisite for access to justice and a prerequisite for a lot of the work that people in this community are interested in. And so what the Case Law Access Project does is it makes available, as you guys mentioned, uh, 360 years of uh, US case law, 6.7 million unique cases. And it gives us access to these cases in a way that is much easier for researchers to handle, um, especially when you're looking at them en masse and not as a one-off the way we've usually and historically thought about them. 
Um, so concretely, what I've been uh, doing uh, together with uh, Sandra Lira, one of the researchers at the Human Dynamics uh, Group, is trying to think about um, how we can understand um, class action lawsuits, federal class action lawsuits, and the financial dynamics and the various kind of other dynamics that underpin them um, by extracting data from cases. So what we've did, done is uh, we've built uh, tools, machine learning tools that help us extract information about all federal class actions. So we've identified what we think is a set of all federal class action lawsuits. We're starting to pull data out of them uh, that ranges from something relatively trivial, like the name of the judge, uh, to things that are harder to find, like the amount of the settlement, um, or whether a case was granted or denied. And so we're using things like sentence analysis um, and all sorts of other kind of cool tools that are out there and trying to apply them to the law. Um, and the cool thing here, and the exciting thing about the Case Law Access Project is one, I think that as this movement, if you want to call it a movement, goes viral, um, we're going to see a lot more of these data sets and we're going to figure out how we can interrogate them and, and get information out of them. Um, and answer legal questions in new ways. And two, because this is all so new and so fresh, there's an endless number of questions you could be asking and an endless number of tools you could be applying. So I encourage you to you know, get your hands dirty. It's, it's relatively trivial to get research access um, if you're affiliated with the university. Um, and, and this is really a fantastic data set um, and, and can answer some really good questions. So thank you both for grabbing me and thank you both for all the incredible work. Awesome. And so if you, I encourage you to take a look uh, in our first release at Robert's um, presentation to our research group on um, last Wednesday, where he digs in kind of slide by slide, kind of, you know, um, dimension of the data by dimension of the data, use case by use case, and insight by insight. There's a, what you can reveal about this type of um, very important litigation, you know, that deals with you know, large populations of people and, and, and holds the potential to um, be one of the ways that society can balance, um, you know, as, as new technologies and implications, um, you know, emerge and, and, uh, and, and, and think about the questions that you could pose to the data in a sense, like what could you ask or what could you learn um, from the data that would help us to optimize the system. So I think your, your research is now in the exploratory phase, I think it's safe to say, and you are receptive to good ideas. Please, yes, yeah, send them along. <laughs> so um, take a look at the full presentation on our site in the Rich Media section. And um, you've got ideas, bring them. And uh, let's, um, let's hack the law together. So thanks so much, Robert. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and so now we're going to do a quick um, kind of disco turnaround and get into um, our, you know, there's nothing more important um, in all the things that we're doing are with this field building and computational law and look to apply it to combat modern slavery and human trafficking. And so uh, we've got a task force and we're going to convene right now to learn more about that. So um, stand by for about 45 seconds while we recombobulate ourselves. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, could you go ahead and pull up what I sent you by, um, by email? Uh, the, okay. One second, please.
so uh, to get started, um, Shauna, um, also a member of our advisory um, board, um, could, could you, would you be so kind as to, uh, there we go, uh, as to introduce yourself and, and um, get us into the second where we're going to take a look at the task force that we've set up at the computational law report on this topic. So, so I'm going to take it away. Absolutely. So this actually started um, when Des and I were at Ilticon a couple months ago, and we had this conversation uh, that discussed data and different data points, and one of the things that I know was heartbreaking to both you and I is the issue of modern-day slavery, but also human trafficking. And as we started to dig into it a little bit deeper, um, it was fascinating to think of all the different opportunities we have between the people that you know and the people that Kind of we know. So um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shauna Hoffman, and I'm with IBM. I co-lead our cognitive legal practice, and we are a global practice that works all over the world. So I'm seeing, especially on my travels um, to various different countries, I do see many things that, um, you know, gosh, we'd love to put our data hats on and, and start to combat some of these things that are uh, definitely devastating the world. So um, we do believe in, especially in 2020, that one of the important items that we can do is to make a huge difference for people who are caught in human trafficking. And so I have a few people here with me today. I'd love to have them introduce themselves. To my right is Tomas. Sure, I'm Tomas Mars. I'm the founder and the president of United Abolitionists based in Winter Park, Florida, which is in Central Florida. And it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Brian Elisney. I'm the head of Thompson Reuters Labs Americas and uh, very excited to be part of this effort. I am Wilfredo Martinez. I am a senior judge with the state of Florida and a board member of the United Abolitions. Thank you very much. Adriana. Uh, we do have Adriana who's joining us from France. And Adriana and I met in Greece uh, right after uh, Des and I had this discussion. So it was just fortuitous that all of us got together. Um, and uh, she, uh, I'll let you talk about the future of society and the things that you've been doing to really um, combat some of the social issues globally. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Hello from Paris. Uh, my name is Adriana, and I'm an AI policy researcher and project manager at the Future Society, a think and do tank uh, with the mission of uh, helping create the global ethical governance of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I thought that it was kind of fun. I was chatting back when Robert was speaking. I was chatting with Adriana. I said, did you see, I just put the word trafficking in, and as we looked at cases in your Harvard cases, look at the increase in cases just over the past few decades. And so this is, a, this is an increasing problem, but there's also more transparency than we've ever had before. You know, we do believe that this is definitely a data issue and something that we as legal and technologists can come together to first off gather all the data, but then start to see what patterns we see. So um, tell us, what are some of the things that you've been seeing um, that the, maybe some of the patterns, and I know you're, you're right in the forefront um, of the day-to-day. -day. So actually, I think it'd be maybe helpful for those who are, who are listening to hear a little bit more about the real-life stories. And, yeah, please. So I've been uh, almost for 16 years now an advocate uh, for survivors of human trafficking, both foreign-born, domestic, uh, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, domestic servitude and also a male, female, or uh, many that have uh, identified as LGBT, especially the transgender community. And so uh, really, unfortunately, there has been less uh, and, and because of the political atmosphere and uh, the really the broken immigration policies, uh, more of the foreign-born victims are not coming forward like they were many years ago. Um, we're seeing less of those cases. Although we know that there's probably been an increase just based on uh, survivors that have come forth uh, confidentially, um, whether they've been sex or in, in mainly labor in that field. Um, and so our concern is that uh, we're not really getting the, uh, the numbers are correct, uh, whether you're working with the uh, federal, state, or local level. And that's something uh, that's why we're here is to see how we can work together to gather that data. Yeah, so I think one of the big issues we were talking about earlier is the data itself needing to be able to tell the story. So we believe that there's not, an, not enough of the data being aggregate, aggregated correctly, and they're not seeing the patterns so that the states can come around and actually put together the right programs. You know, um, Judge Martinez, you were talking a little bit about um, how it took about 15 years for domestic violence changes 
And maybe we're seeing the same thing here. Right. It, 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 uh, and by the way, domestic violence in uh, modern day slavery go hand in hand. But it, it was about 15 years to change the mentality of, well, that's something between two individuals in their relationship to understanding that it is uh, a, a societal crime. It is uh, not good. And so it took about 15 years for legislatures to start understanding that and start instituting the, the laws to protect victims of human trafficking and to call it what it is. And with, with modern day slavery and, and human trafficking, we expect to see about that same type of, of route. And we were talking before, and I think we're in about maybe about year four or five with regards to the public becoming aware of the issue. But yet we miss that data. We don't have that data to let people know that this is not the situation where you have a 13 year old girl being smuggled in from South America and being sexually exploited. Um, what we're seeing is basically modern day slavery and um, human trafficking related to our neighbors. It's right in our backyard. And, and yet in order to be able to start changing that mentality like in domestic violence, we need that data to start showing members of, of the United States that this is not something from another country. This is um, domestic. Yes. And I encourage, I believe that's coming from as well, Sean, that the technology that's increased, social media that's increased, the apps, um, uh, more and more uh, of the traffickers, uh, those that are, uh, we say the, the customers, the buyers, the Johns, are now using uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And so for evil, and so how can we come together to use technology to combat this extreme heinous crime? Because we know that our, our it's just gonna increase, right? We're in the digital age. And so I really, I feel like we need to catch up with uh, the traffickers are using right, uh, technology. How can we combat it with technology? Absolutely. Well, and that's actually a really very good point. Um, and I think that one of the key things that right now we have a group of people in the dark world. We have a group of, I mean, my gosh, we have, they're very advanced. Now, those people who are watching today and as a, and everybody in the room, we are tremendously advanced. If we were to all come together to combat this problem, we can take these guys and gals down so that we don't have these issues moving forward. We can decrease this line going up. And the number that I saw was about 2% of cases. I mean, I'm just, mortified by that. Um, Adriana, I know you've got some great statistics for us to share. This is what we have collected so far, um, but we need your help to continue to grow this. Um, we need your brains, even though you may, may not know much about human trafficking, what we need is, you know, is groups to come together and to start looking at these problems. Adriana. Thank you very much. So I will have a short presentation with some information that uh, we have collected. I will share my screen. Um, to present it. And um, before um, getting into the task that, um, I'm not sure if you could see um, my screen. Uh, I see a big picture of my face, <laughs> but um, what, I, um, what I would like to start with is um, to, um, to start by trying to give a definition to the problem of modern slavery. And uh, when we think about slavery, we tend to go back to the convention of 1926 uh, to suppress slavery and slavery trade. Uh, and in this, slavery is defined as a condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attached to the right of ownership are being exercised. But when we try to look for legal definitions of modern slavery, we realize that modern slavery is not yet defined by law, uh, but in fact is an umbrella term that incorporates commonalities about, across different legal concepts. And essentially what modern slavery is, is any situation in which, of exploitation of, in which the person cannot refuse to live because uh, it is um, abuse uh, through violence and coercion. 
So when we try to look across the world and understand different forms of uh, those legal concepts uh, that can be encapsulated under this definition, we realize that in fact modern slavery um, can take many forms. And in the global north, as perfectly we hear today, we are more inclined to think that it only takes the form of human trafficking, which means this idea of people being transported or recruitment, this idea of movement of people from one place to another for being uh, exploited through coercion of, or violence. But as correctly was uh, just presented today, slavery can take place in, uh, in the place of birth or just next door. So there are also cases, for instance, of descent-based slavery, where people are just being born in slavery because their ancestors could not um, pay their debts or they were already captured into slavery and they pass the slavery on to uh, the next generation. We also have debt bondage where people um, borrow money because normally the people that face uh, the risk of being enslaved are people under high risk of slavery. So let's say there are cases when um, um, extreme poverty, fam families under extreme poverty um, have one of their children being sick and then the perpetrators come and say, look, we can give you the money you need now to pay for your children, but you are gonna come and work for me for the next six months or for the next season. Well, what's happening is people say, yes, of course I will come, I will pay back my debts. But what indeed is happening is that they will get trapped into this new condition of work that will never allow them to exit and they're being going to be used and exploited um, at the free will of the perpetrator, which normally happens for the rest of their life. And then we have forced labor where people are forced to provide services under threat and forced marriages falls into this definition as well, where especially young women fall um, to be uh, sold or just given into marriages without their consent. And finally, the worst form of modern slavery is child slavery, which is even beyond the worseness of child labor, which already possesses many challenges for children development, because in fact here, children are being exploited for the gains of other people. So this can be trafficking for um, sexual exploitation, child soldiers, marriages, or domestic slavery. And to this form, you can add for begging or organs, but what this I'm trying to show here is the amplitude of different forms that slavery can take nowadays across the globe. And now it comes to the number, how big of the problem are we actually facing? Of course, slavery is a very, is a under um, a crime uh, that is covered, it's very hard to be approximated, um, but uh, the latest estimates show us that we have around 40.3 million people in slavery today, out of which 15.4 are enforced marriages. Um, this leaves us with an overwhelmed 24.9 million people into forced uh, labor, out of which four are imposed by states. Um, so this is in high authoritarian states, but we also have 4.8 uh, million people into sexual exploitation nowadays, out of which 99% are women. But what we see is that this leaves us with 60 million people that work into the private sector. Sure, some of them in domestic uh, work, but most of uh, the others in agriculture, fishing, mining, and the products and services that they are produced end up in the global supply chain and then end up on the clothes that we're wearing or on the food that we're eating. So slavery is connected with us, even if it seems a remote issue that happens down south or not uh, connected to our day-to-day -day life. But if we really want to step back and look at these uh, statistics from a different angle, we can also see that women are the most uh, affected by this uh, crime. When we include all the forms of modern slavery, they represent over 75% of um, the victims. But if we exclude forced marriages, for instance, we still are left with 58% of the victim being women. But most importantly, one in each of, um, in four victims is a child. So I hope this illustrates the magnitude of the problem that we are facing today when we talk about modern slavery. So we have to turn to the international community and say, okay, what is the framework that we have 
there that can help us uh, create the communication platform to start uh, eradicating. So when we look at the agenda, the sustainable development agenda, we see that there is not a sustainable development goal uh, directly addressing modern slavery, but we have a target, the target 8.7. And this target says, and I quote, to take immediate and effective measure to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst form of child labor, including recruitment, use of child soldier, and by 2025, and child labor in all its form. So what does it mean is that we have five years to eliminate all forms of child labor and less than 10 years to eliminate all the types of modern slavery that I was just describing. So we really think, because evidence is showing we are really lacking behind to meeting this target. We really think it's time to innovate and it's time to look at a very interdisciplinary and multi-stakeholder approach to this issue. So this is the mission and the contribution that we are hoping to show to you today and to convince you to, to collaborate is to bring together the international community, the modern slavery experts, technology and innovation with the, global, with the sole purpose to have a rapid development of solution to eradicate modern slavery. And to do so, we believe that a global hackathon will provide the best opportunity to, um, to create this space of collaboration between the stakeholders. So we are hoping that in December 2nd, 2020, uh, at the same date with the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery, so almost a year from now, to hold a international hackathon where um, all the people, the organizations, the institutions that have expertise, data, and resources that they would like to bring to this cause could come together and uh, they put their minds and their resources together to uh, start uh, thinking of innovative projects that can help us um, accelerate the eradication of modern slavery. We did a quick search. There are over 300 uh, NGOs and companies working for different types of slavery across the globe. We really think we have now an opportunity to connect them and to give them a platform to collaborate. Of course, there have been some hackathons uh, organized already. Uh, most, most of them in the last two years, uh, predominantly based in North America and South America and one in Europe. Uh, and mainly targeting human trafficking and child um, safety. But we believe that with this global hackathon, we can provide an opportunity and a fair chance for all the victims in all types of slavery to be addressed through technology. So our action plan, the way we will envision doing so, is to start by having a call for action and support and data, a design thinking workshop where we evaluate the process, then start with a prototype and a, a data creation um, uh, process, hold the hackathon and write a paper where we collect the information and guide future implementation of methods and solutions. So practically, the way we envision the time frame and the roadmap of this is now in December to start um, uh, addressing and co uh, commence the call for action uh, which was going to take place uh, for the entire duration of the year. But in February, to meet here in Paris, to have the design uh, thinking workshop where we evaluate the initial response, the initial donation and data, um, and uh, that would allow us to see the feasibility of, a, of and the scope of the hackathon. After that, we have two months to prepare for our initial hackathon, the prototype that will take place in Florida. And with this lesson learned and with data that we can collect over time, we will prepare um, uh, the, the hackathon that will take place in December 2nd, 2020. Uh, hopefully at around the, the same time with the UN events um, related to modern slavery and then spend the last two months on writing the paper. So with no further ado, I would like to give the floor back to Shona to go a bit more in depth into this um, first step of the ask for uh, support and data and then to my colleagues of give a bit more in depth, um, more depth to this presentation with their uh, very fruitful careers and expertise that they've been collecting. Thank you. 
Thank you. So thank you so much, Adriana. You know, thank you. Okay, so yes, thank you, Adriana. And I'm always amazed with those statistics. Sometimes it just seeps into my soul to really think about one in four children. Um, you know, as a mom, that just kills me. And I can't imagine. I know, um, Brian, you have a, a lot of, um, you and you've been, your companies are doing a lot in this space, and you personally have been too. Yeah, so I mean, so Thompson Motors has been very involved in human trafficking for quite a while. So um, we sponsored journalists all over the world reporting on this issue. Uh, my lab in particular has been very focused on uh, labor trafficking. So um, uh, it's been illegal, you know, in the U.S. since the 1930s to import uh, goods made with uh, slave labor. But, um, you know, until recently, those laws have not been um, really enforced. Uh, and a, a good development is legally around the world, there are now legal frameworks springing up like the UK Modern Slavery Act and now the Australian Modern Slavery Act. The Dutch have, have recently passed this incredible um, Child Labor Due Diligence Act that says you have to not only say I'm not aware of any child labor in, in things I'm importing, but I, I can certify that there is no child labor in it behind anything that I'm reporting. So the world is really catching up to these frameworks, but people need tools to comply with them. Uh, so we, for example, we, we did a, a proof of concept a few years ago where we took all the data that we could get our hands on at TR, which is lots and lots of data, and uh, evaluated three and a half million companies for their risk of forced labor uh, using you know, legal pleadings, financial data, uh, financial crime records, um, the news, you know, so we have the Reuters News Agency and, and, and so on. So we took everything that we had, uh, scored three and a half million companies. We found that only one tenth of one percent of those companies had any historical data linking them to forced labor. So, but we know that, you know, the problem is much more uh, extensive than that. Um, in global trade, you know, uh, the um, we're, we're, the global trade system has you know adopted the internet and now you know all of these sorts of invoices and, and everything is done electronically through computers um, with the advent of uh, you know emerging standards on top of blockchain like verifiable credentials and centralized identifiers and so on we're beginning to see that there's the possibility of, of making all of this stuff. Uh, in supply chains to be able to evaluate supply chains for forced labor, making all of this stuff computationally tractable, but in ways that preserve companies' privacy and their trade secrets about who they're getting their supplies from and what price they're paying and so on. They, people won't divulge that you know, for a good reason. But in order to track all this stuff, we need some, some way to to uh, follow these supply chains all the way down to raw materials. So I think, you know, um, this global hackathon doesn't necessarily have to focus on this particular train of thought, but I mean, I think this is one fruitful area in which uh, we're at a point where we can actually make good progress at addressing the, the 8.7 goal. Um, and, uh, and the challenge that these new legal frameworks are presenting for consumers and co companies to finally say, look, uh, if not not to say, I'm not aware of any slave labor, um, but actually become aware in, in, a, in a global way. Here, here, um, and so Brian, uh, just to follow up, you had taken me um, and really opened my eyes uh, in New York to the United Nations um, 8.7 kind of convening um, over the summer. And I know that's an initiative that you've been very involved with. I was wondering if you could share any other um, ideas that you've heard with respect to how data could be used or what uh, you, you went to the supply chain right back to raw materials. What else? I, I noticed there's a lot of nonprofits and NGOs and um, companies and governments <clears throat> that have been about a lot of bots. You're more familiar with it than I am. Could you give us a sample of some of the thoughts on what data is out there that's relevant and how could, what are some of the ideas of how it could be leveraged in order to start to combat modern slavery? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the most interesting 
uh, presentations that we saw at the UN um, gathering that James Peking put together uh, was uh, the University of Nottingham group who were doing really amazing things with satellite imagery and identifying uh, where brick kilns were in, in South Asia. So brick kilns are a notorious site of um, uh, forced labor and child labor. But no one really has a sense of where these brick kilns are. They're just, you know, these kind of odd structures that are generally in, in sort of remote places. Um, uh, but using satellite imagery, these, this, this group in Nottingham was able to uh, train machine learning models to identify these things by air and get a much better handle on exactly how many of these kilns there are in South Asia. Therefore, we can estimate how many people are, are likely to be um, enslaved there and so on. So um, that's another, I think, uh, very interesting application. But uh, we, we heard a lot about it there in the as well. And so um, what we're trying to do, uh, or what we're, well, I guess what we're now announcing that we're doing yes. uh, is, uh, <laughs> oh, uh, did, yeah, one second. I, no, I just, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. For those of you that are related to the law, this is an opportunity when I heard computational law. For those of you that are consumers within the court system, you know that the court system is clogged. A lot of that clogging has to do with regards to um, modern day slavery. And so if you're involved in business and you're wondering why it's taking three years for your case to get to trial, in part it's because of the clogging and the traffickers know this. I mean, it's not, that they know that they're clogging up the system and that also delays the prosecution of, of traffickers as well. So this is a fantastic opportunity for the court system to understand this problem and then for the court system to quantify it and be able to lobby within itself and also with the legislature to change the laws and the rules in order to help save these victims. And thank you. Thank you. So what, what I wanted to take my way to wrap it yeah. is on. So this is. Oh, oh I didn't want to go ahead and go over that. Oh, perfect. Yes. Is that good? Yeah. Please say that. Absolutely. Just yeah. based on the judge talked about the legal and uh, Brian, uh, the whole labor, right, the supply chain. I just want to highlight, I was involved in the first Super Bowl uh, against human trafficking in 2009 in Tampa, Florida, with the uh, Bureau, uh, Bureau of Investigation and others, um, that the whole complicity in the hospitality industry, hotels specifically, that say, uh, you know, they turn a blind eye. So there's many cases that are going to be coming out in the next year uh, using the, the federal, our federal law here in the United States. Uh, more and more, and now there's been states going to start uh, also creating their own laws. In Florida now, it's mandatory for every uh, hotel to, under House Bill 851, to have training. And the next year, it'll still be fine, starting October 1st, 2020, $2,000 a day to train the workers. Now, I'm saying that because the complicity and kind of what triggered me, Brian, when you said that was people are, even though you may look at what we, we know and say, well, there's not a lot of cases, right? In, in hotels and hospitality industry, you've got to find trafficking. It's because we haven't really, uh, we're not asking them all the right questions. And then there, again, there's not the data to support the survivors uh, know which hotels, motels, resorts, even Airbnb that they were trafficked in. So, you know, people say, is this occurring? Yes, it's occurring. And it's global, right, with the hospitality industry. And what my goal is that we can begin to create some tools, even for the hospitality industry, and you know, maybe uh, the hotels, the spas, the restaurants, and or the uh, transportation uh, uh, companies, so that we, we can help identify what is occurring, because it's alive um, and well, and, and it's occurring, and we know that by hundreds of survivors' uh, testimony that we work with. So I just wanted to say that that's the importance of this, it's critical. Thank you. Yes. And it's important and couldn't be more urgent. Yeah, I and mean, we are at the infancy of something that hopefully will not take as long as it did for domestic violence. 15 years is too long. We can combat this now. Um, and I believe that we have the right people too. Adriana, do you want to go ahead and pull that slide up? Uh, we have an initial ask for everyone who's in this room and also those who are listening. And um, the first one, um, what do we pull up, is that, I mean, number one, of course, is data. 
So we are looking for um, ideas on how we can best collect the data. We had a really great conversation with, with Sandy earlier and Sandy's ideas in, in regards to encryption, but we'd like to um, start to look at the patterns within the data. And that'll be part of the hackathon, but then also building some of the applications and um, you know, ideas around what would combat this. I think this is gonna be something that's intellectually stimulating and also something that's tremendously challenging as we start to look at this massively huge problem that is a feelings issue, but really if we stand back, it's a data issue. It's the things that we as legal technologists are really good at doing. And so um, we, we're looking for data, um, data collection uh, places also, and then also building teams. So our hackathon teams. And then if you have a, if you have a company or if you have a university, we'd love to have you host um, and lead that hackathon. We've got packets that uh, we're putting together so that you will have all the packets that you need, all the information that you need to host the organization. Um, we'd love to have your university. We'd love to have your corporation. Um, and, you know, or your law firm hosts that location, and we are hoping to have minimally 50 locations globally because we'd like to do a global effort uh, as we get the data globally um, and then also see what's unique to each of those locations of each of those regions. And of course, sponsorship. I mean, sponsorship of the MIT Computational Law Report is tremendously important. That sponsorship will then, of course, um, partial portions of it or whatever you um, would like to apply to this project. Um, would be key because we do need sponsorship to be able to make this happen and then also to be able to um, you know, to build and, and grow this team. You know, we'd love to, I think, number one, start with human trafficking, but grow into the entire area of slavery. I think we can make, a, you know, this first year, I think we can make a huge dent in many of the issues that you're running into because, I mean, I know you and your team are just working uh, nonstop, you know, 24-7. We tried to have a call yesterday and you were on a sting operation. <laughs> it was like literally taking it to the streets and I, it's not hyperbole to say this can't be more urgent. Absolutely. There are people enslaved right now. People are suffering. And that's why this is the most important issue that we're pursuing. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and just to give some of that a little bit of light, I mean, even some of the things that I've seen, I've seen girls branded. For those of you who are technologists, RFID chips, they're putting them in young women from what I, I, we actually had one come into one of the clinics, I do some work in and I was shocked. She said she had been tagged, I didn't quite understand what she was talking about. And then we found a chip inside of her. So there are things that we need to combat and now before it does get out of control. Yes, and if I may say this as well, is that so much emphasis was given this past year to the Jeffrey Epstein case. I mean, that went global, right? But that's just one person that was exploiting and, and sexually assaulting uh, minor girls and, and others, uh, adult women as well. This is one person, this is happening every day. As we speaking right now, uh, in every country, in every state, in the United States, we should be just as upset, and not just because of uh, some, uh, some billionaire was doing this, but that it's happening every day to, to children and to just, uh, it's a human rights issue, it's a crisis, and uh, that needs to stop. Yeah, so with transparency, we can all see what we may not know, or I guess don't even sometimes care to know, too. Yeah, so, yeah. the data can, uh, can reveal what's happening in reality, and it can also begin to uh, provide some means to measure how well we're doing at combating it. Yes. Um, so, um, so what I was going to say a moment ago, and I think this might be the right time, is <clears throat> um, I know uh, you and Brian and others um, in, on the uh, advisory board, and we would invite them to the task force. We'll be having meetings to figure out a charter and, and, and everything. But I know that um, Brian Wilson and I are ready, as soon as you tell us to, to create a task force page and to include, at a minimum, a way that everybody, all of you out there, dear listeners, dear viewers, um, fellow humans, team human, um, to sign up to participate and collaborate with this team as we kind of go forward to share your ideas, uh, to share concepts of data, and to participate in some of these activities, and to review ideas and provide feedback. And another thing that I think we can do, uh, because Sandy said we could this morning, um, is uh, leading up to um, uh, Adriana's uh, brainstorm in Paris, which sounds very interesting, getting back to fundraising. And we'd love to go to Paris for that if we could. 
um, although we have Zoom in a pinch. Uh, but leading up to that, we can um, host, a, I guess I'll call it an exploratory or preliminary meeting here, um, where once you've had a, like about a month or six weeks or so to figure out what you think the plan will be, um, you know, toward early February, late January, we can do some convening um, in the United States uh, here at MIT to look at the idea or even the alternative ideas. Sandy has kindly agreed, Sandy Pentland, to participate in that. We may be able to draw from other of our communities here. Uh, thanks to Robert Mahari, we've been collab collaborating uh, with the Civil Rights Division uh, at the Department of Justice, and they have human trafficking as part of their, um, their uh, portfolio uh, for, uh, for what they're combating. I won't speak for them other than to say to the public, uh, they're very much actively looking for ways they can use data to um, measurably um, allocate their resources better um, to know like what, what to work on. Could you measure deterrence? Could we measure uh, how well we're putting a dent in or interdicting um, these crimes before they start? Um, how can they, they have limited resources for prosecutors and in investigation? How, 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 from their perspective, it's again a day to day question. How can data assist them? Maybe people like them will have some good ideas to bring to the table as well. Maybe you will have great ideas about um, what we could be doing. We, and we need to hear about, um, we need all ideas and everyone's gonna have to put an oar in the water, I think, to, to fix this, you know? And there's no dumb idea, I promise you. Just like that movie, Meet the Robinsons from Disney, sometimes the worst ideas actually end up being the best. So um, but we would love to invite you to the task force. We'd love to invite you to Paris. Uh, to join us at the Future Society. I know Adriana would be great, glad to host us. Anyone who wants to pay your own way, we're more than happy to have you join us. We'll, we'll make sure that you have that opportunity. We're gonna have um, a full day session of whiteboarding uh, with the team there. And I think it'll be really a good time um, and very eye-opening. Yes, well, I mean, we all know that, uh, we all know the power it takes a village, right, to raise a child. Well, it takes a, an army of abolitionists and, and modern day abolitionists to put a dent in this crime. And I think this is the time, the hour. Um, and so thank you, uh, Sean, for bringing us together. Uh, and God, I can't wait to meet you in Paris and, um, and in Florida. But um, yeah, come together with us. This is the time. Things are really coming together, as we see uh, globally, nationally, uh, in the fight against human trafficking. Here, here. Thank you. In Massachusetts, you know, a long history of abolition. So, um, yes. you know, we, 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 unfortunately, it's time to revive that. So mm -hmm. with that, I want to thank um, all of you um, who have taken the initiative uh, to, to take time out of your days uh, to, to be in leadership positions on this task force. And, um, you know, without you, we wouldn't be doing this. So thanks for the opportunity to, to try to allocate what resources and thoughts we have uh, to make a difference in, in this most important task. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. MIT's support. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. MIT. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another <laughs> disco transition. All right. Dance. Uh, announcements. Yeah. And now we the show. Oh, even better. Okay. Here we go. Oh, to really show. Prove it. Fantastic. Here. And are we still live? We're still live. I'm good. Okay, we're live. So just a few more minutes off the wrap. And then um, <coughs> those of you that are here will do the tour of the media lab. Um, and if you want to be okay. main contributors to the MIT Computational Law Report and come to a future event, you can meet the robots too in a future tour. Um, as though just contributing isn't enticement enough. Right, so um, we now want to do a quick set of thank yous, and I'm going to do my share here, my share, and announcements for what's, what's coming up next. So, 
Ah, uh, here we are. So the first and perhaps most important thing to note is moments ago, um, we switched <laughs> the, um, the uh, permission settings on the computational law report, um, which is computationallaw.pubpub.org, but, um, but our main front door is just law.mit.edu um, to public. Yes. So it went from private to public. And so that is what we call the soft launch. Yay! <laughs> yes, and um, if you click on about, we want to thank our team. Um, to, um, so thank you, Nessa, for uh, you know getting this. Uh, seeding the kernel of computational law years and years ago and kind of having it grow into this. Like I, I can speak for everybody here. We wouldn't be here without uh, without your guidance and stewardship and you know watering the little planty that turned into the computational law plant. <laughs> thank you. Um and thank you Brian for um for basically um, stopping your previously scheduled life <laughs> and flying out here to Boston um and really digging in uh, as a as a of our newer, newest brass members uh, of the uh, MIT community and the computational law research team and really really bringing this thing to life um, as editor-in-chief. Um, Sandy Pentland, of course, is another person with whom this would not be possible as our faculty sponsor, and sort of um, like the big vision person. Uh, we talked, uh, we want to thank Bob Craig, um, who we've mentioned already, CIO of Baker Hostetler, our board of advisors, Michelle Gitlitz, um, who has a new designation. Yeah, she's in Crowell and Warren. Yeah, she's um, moving on up. Shauna Hoffman, um, who's joined us in person today. Thank you, Shauna, from IBM. David Horrigan from Relativity, um, who I hope will be joining us to fill out our podcasts. Um, you guys haven't, your ears haven't lived until you've heard this guy's mellifluous voice. It is so good. So he's going to fill out our audio soundscape very nicely, especially powered by the fuel of his mind. That's true. Um, he's a smart guy who's connected. Daniel Katz. Dan Katz is um, is it Chicago Ken? Yeah, Chicago Ken, one of one of the granddaddies of this concept of computational law. Very yeah. much a real thought leader. Um, Kat Moon. Uh, Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Um, program on law and innovation, yeah. which I think is really cool that they actually have a standalone program for that. So she's helping to hatch young computational lawyers uh, from law school and, uh, and one of our authors. Um, Christoph Pereira, um, who's a, um, I think he's chief risk chief officer, risk officer and um, chief counsel at General Electric um, for their um, uh, business innovation scheme and uh, their corporate counsels, the SEC stuff and corporate governance and very creative, great guy. Um, Elizabeth Reneris, um, who's now a fellow at the, uh, the Berkman um, Center for yeah. Law and Policy. Berkman Klein Center for the Internet and Society. Even better, it has word internet in it and society. Um, and she's been a terrific collaborator and uh, is also an author on a piece uh, that will be um, made public soon. I am the obstacle on that one. I have finished writing my section. Um, TMA Roguer, who is um, with us in the room today, uh, and she's a proper legal hacker. She and is. she's uh, also helped us co teach the computational law course here at MIT in the past. And, very creative, and of course, Brian Ulysses, um, oh, right. uh, yeah, to distinguish <laughs> uh, who runs uh, the, the Boston location of Thomson Reuters Labs, and um, who actually is an MIT alum as well uh, in linguistics. Um, he was snuck through the first computational linguistics, I think, uh, um, PhD, or at least one of them. Anyway, he's a pioneer. <laughs> he, he also gets the award for most Thomas Pynchon references in humans that we've seen. That's true. There you go. So stand by for the awards category on our site. <laughs> um, editors, um, uh, Mila uh, from San Paulo, and a proper she's, legal pastor. She's at a startup uh, as counsel there, doing some really innovative stuff at Storm.io. Indeed. Jonathan Askin, the um, progenitor of the legal hackers movement and a law professor at Brooklyn Law School. Yep. Very creative man. Um, Jameson Dempsey, um, who was a Stanford Codex um, fellow last year and is also the sort of executive director. He's the global policy uh, counsel for Loom, the alphabet company that's uh, looking at uh, deploying satellites to uh, have Wi-Fi in areas all around the globe. Yeah, very, very interesting. He, he was a sort of telecom attorney for a time. And he's also the 
the kind of like um, you know, director and a, a, a spiritual leader almost of Legal Hackers International. Um, uh, Diana Fernandez, uh, who's also a proper legal hacker. Yeah, she's getting a PhD in something related to law and computation in Portugal. And uh, she's she's been instrumental in helping us set up the the finder the finder page that we've got among many other things. And she also helped us some as a teacher's assistant in, in our course last year. Yes. I think her role will be elevated this year. Sarah Glassmeyer, another real yeah, uh, cornerstone. The, she's she's a program officer at the ABA Center for Innovation that I met when I was a fellow there um, several years ago. And she's also sort of. Um, Ascended from Harvard. Uh, yeah, she's at the Berkman Center, and she she's her. I think her background's really interesting because she's a librarian, and so many of these uh, these issues that relate to computational law, uh, they they really harken back to this idea of quantifying language, and you know, librarians have been dealing with that for a long time, and so I think this is a, a really great. Uh, you know, I, I think the diversity of roles that we have uh, or backgrounds that we have is something that. Uh, is very exciting as we try and see this interdisciplinary field a little bit more. So true, you know, the library science, knowledge management, exactly what we need now as the law becomes you know, truly a digital network enterprise. Um, Tony Lai, um, who is a co-founder of Legal.io, is also a Codex Fellow, he runs their blockchain research, uh, research group out there and uh, another proper legal hacker, and he's been invaluable from the very beginning of this effort. He has a terrific UK accent, too, that you don't want to miss. Robert Mahari, who, who's joined us in person, who you just met, and again, you can't emphasize enough, MIT alum, and now a law student. So this is the shape of things to come. And um, Gabe Tenenbaum, last but not least, um, a law professor at Suffolk University Law School, yeah. um, which is another um, innovation bed for law and technology. Um, they've, had, um, they've been doing terrific work, and they have a lit Legal Innovation and Technology, technology Lab. Um, and he's also just a very creative person. It's lit. <laughs> and enlightening. Um, so what if you want to get involved? What if you would like to make a contribution? Or if you want to contact us? I don't know. Hey, look down here. Um, we, we've got a little something at the bottom of the uh, about page, which is, um, yeah. this is an, a bit of an, Oops, we can fix that right now. Uh, which is a, a bit of uh, so a little bit different for me. Actually, I only do forms, but uh, we're kind of reaching out now with a direct email address. So we'll see how that goes. But for the time being, at least um, contact at computationallaw.org. Um, you can join our Telegram group, which is pretty active, the computational law um, kind of chat group, um, which is more informal on Telegram. Um, and if you're you know so inclined, you can go to our public facing GitHub repository and um, you know, use issue tickets there or make contributions. Um, and of course, you can join an email list by um, going to our law.mit.edu contact page. That's probably the very best way to just kind of get on the radar um, because forms are structured data. It goes into a nice database and we kind of get back to you in an organized way. But there's many, we've got options here. For getting in contact with us. But what if you already know for sure you want to submit an article, you want to submit some data science? We have a button for you at the top menu nav bar here, submit. And so uh, we accept written content. Um, you saw some of the initial articles today. It could be three lengths, long, medium, or short. Yeah, we, we're pretty flexible. Then <laughs> we accept rich media. Um, so um, we you, you saw a video of from Harvard Law School of, uh, of their legal symposium. So it will be publishing soon, but it just ran out of time. Uh, so maybe tonight or tomorrow, you will see the Legal Tech Live um, video podcast. Yes, uh, that was a very fun podcast with some of our, our good friends. Yep, uh, Nick and, and um, Hannah, who are the hosts. And we basically go through some of the dimensions of what, what computational law is. And so anyway, you've got rich media, you want to share, you have an infographic, um, a visualization, um, podcast, video, bring it if it's re relevant. And uh, so you, we'll see whatever editorial yeah. board thinks. And if it makes the cut, you're in. If you can describe it in a form, we're interested to hear what it is. 
And you know, the best thing is to put through structured data inputs like forms, of course, are data themselves. And so if you've got data science, if you have a data set that you have rights to share, um, so like the open source, creative commons, very important. Um, if you have an application of some kind um, that is under uh, uh, an open license so that um, we can accept it and we can publish it and distribute it, we have an input for you. In fact, um, there's nothing more important than actually bringing computational law itself and the, and the rudiments and components of computational law, data and applications and data science projects, Python notebooks, or Jupyter notebooks, or R notebooks. What, if notebooks are a good way to share or you can just share your script and your data set or your whatever it is that you have if it's open source, let us know. And, um, and the key thing that we're looking to do here is use some of the, the key method for science and, um, and, 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 and MIT approach is making sure that we can achieve reproducibility. So can others who aren't already on your team take the work that you did and achieve the same results? And there's one or two ways that could go. Either they do or they don't. Both of those are good. Um, so from a scientific perspective, it's not a failure and there's no shame in doing that. They actually learn by having others attempt to reproduce your work. And then we share where the gap was. And sometimes people have failed to reproduce work, then tinker with it so they can reproduce it or on a good day, produce something even better. And we share that back. And in this way we have a kind of um, open culture for innovation um, uh, in this um, area of law. Yeah, and, and there are a couple of things that I'd like to point out here. One is that we are going to have a data set that we're releasing pretty soon. We're in the process of doing a little bit of scrubbing on that and kind of uh, wrangling it into the best proper form that we can to get it uploaded, but we'll have information about uh, from about 160,000 records of uh, pre-trial detention in the state of Maryland. And so if that sounds remotely interesting, you know, um, please reach out to me after we set this up. And it, it would be really interesting to see what can grow out of that, like what analysis you can do from these records. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out is that um, in, the, in the format that we've chosen to present this in, in PubHub, um, there are actually a lot of cool benefits there. Um, you know, the, the conversations aren't like in a traditional academic article where, you know, the article exists as a static thing and uh, authors don't really get feedback except if somebody else writes another article that's about your topic. Um, in PubPub, uh, there's a feature where you can go in and comment on the articles and have a conversation. So if you log in with the username, you know, you can, you can actually start a discussion. And so we're, we're really interested in the, the idea and empowering some of the, the work that the PubPub team has done um, by, you know, seeing what people actually want to say about the law, letting people describe, you know, their, their insights and experience with different uh, facets of it. And then, uh, really op operationalizing that so that um, all of this collective knowledge can be become more useful for everybody. Indeed. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I, I want to thank everybody that came in person today. I want to thank everyone that joined us remotely. And I want to also um, thank all of you who discover and watch this later um, on the law.mit.edu YouTube channel and encourage and uh, and invite you uh, to, to join us on this endeavor for engineering the law, for hacking the law, to cause it to evolve and to transform into a computational system along with the rest of society, but to do it in a way that is well engineered, a way that is deliberate so that we can make this transition with our values intact and achieve the goals explicitly that we've set for ourselves and, and for the broader society. So, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you all for, <laughs> for helping see these fun things. And this soft launch is hereby adjourned. Where's my guy? <laughs>